really powerful um, messages from women that this could be my story. I'm so glad we're talking about this. Um, other women were a little bit, wow, you know, just the topic. And they didn't experience it themselves, but they it put them in a better place to speak with their friends or their family. Um, other, you know, I had heard from one person, I won't tell you who, but she was like, oh my God, there's such great information in this book. I'm already using it with my boyfriend. <laughs> Yes. And then, you know, I had, you know, another reader, she's like, you know, you took a really difficult topic and made it a beach read. So it's kind of, you know, so it's, I feel like people are getting it. It's definitely not for everyone. There's a lot of really intimate um, scenes in the book that, you know, might make some people uncomfortable, but, you know, that's okay. You know, not every book is for everyone, but for those people who need this, it can be really life-giving. Welcome to the Stark Reflections on Writing and Publishing podcast. There has never been a better time for writers. More information, options, and opportunities are available to you. But navigating these requires insight. Join Mark Leslie Lefebvre as he draws upon more than a quarter century of experience as a writer, a bookseller, and a trusted book industry consultant to explore and reflect on the writing and publishing landscape to help you make informed choices on your writer journey. Hello, Reflectives, and welcome to episode 223 of the Stark Reflections podcast. This is your host, Mark Leslie Lefebvre. In today's episode, I have an interview with Paulette Stout. Paulette Stout is the fearless author of Love Only Better, a contemporary novel and bedroom rallying cry for women everywhere. Paulette is the owner of a content marketing agency, Media Goddess Inc., where she crafts content for her list of global clients. And in her prior career as a media buyer slash planner in New York, she earned three industry awards, including a Media Week All-Star. It is a fantastic conversation with Paulette, and that's coming up later in this episode. First, let's hear a word from this episode's sponsor. This episode is sponsored by Findaway Voices. Findaway Voices is a platform that helps authors with getting their audiobooks made and distributed to a global network of retailers and libraries, and it keeps growing. That's right. Findaway Voices just announced a new opportunity for independent authors. Findaway Voices now offers distribution to Books A Million. Founded in 1917, Books A Million is one of the most established book retailers in the United States and is now selling audiobooks. Every wide independent author has reason to be delighted about this announcement, and the audiobook market is continuing to grow with Books A Million now on board. For existing authors... Findaway has updated their digital distribution agreement to reflect the new distribution option and all the payout and business model details. You can find the updated agreement on your My Accounts page. If you're already distributing an audiobook with Findaway Voices, you'll find Books A Million is already on your audiobooks distribution selection page. There's nothing else you need to do. Your audiobook will be available for sale on Books A Million within the next week. If you'd like to opt out of sending your audiobook to Books A Million, you can adjust your selection on the website and republish. It's always that simple with Findaway Voices, making it easy for authors to get their books out into a broad, global distribution network. And I'm thrilled that I have my audiobooks available through Findaway Voices because, and this is sort of an aside and a personal update, but I got selected for a chirp audiobook deal. Yes! Oh my god! January 9th, 2022. After many, many, many rejections, I think maybe a dozen, I got accepted for a 99 cent chirp audiobook deal for a Canadian werewolf in New York. I submitted it. They responded. Uh, they mentioned they're, they are wanting to grow their audience in Canada. So if you were listening to this from my lovely country of Canada... Chirp is available to Canadians. I just went. I didn't even realize it was uh, available to Canadians because when they first launched, it was only in the U.S. So I've downloaded the Chirp app to my Android phone. You can download a free Chirp app on your Android phone or on your iOS systems. But I'm so excited. Uh, I've got this uh, coming out and they've given me some advice on what to do. For example, they recommended uh, other books in the series be dropped below $4.99 
during the time period of this chirp deal because you're four times uh, sell you'll sell up to four times as many copies if books two and three for example are at a reduced price now i am just in the midst of getting ready to launch fright nights big city which is the fourth novel in the series a third full-length novel fourth book in the series and uh, I'm not even sure if the audiobook's going to be done by that point. Uh, the book launches on the 21st of December, 2021. Uh, I'm going to be getting the, the, the finalized manuscript to Scott Robertson, my narrator, my awesome narrator, who is the voice of Michael Andrews. And that's coming out. Um, I'm going to be getting that to him in the next week or so. Um, and we'll see if, uh, if he has time to actually get it complete and I can get it uploaded. Uh, in which case, it may be available on some platforms by the time I get this deal. That's what I'm hoping for. But in any case, the reason I'm mentioning Chirp, and yes, this is extended because I'm mixing it in with a bit of a personal update, is that you can't get your audiobooks into Chirp, which is owned by BookBob, which is why I'm so darned excited about having this uh, Chirp deal. Uh, because, you know, BookBub's kind of like the thing, right? It's the big thing. It's the lottery ticket win if you can get a BookBub deal. Um, but I'm so excited, and the only way you can get your audiobooks into Chirp is through Find Away Voices. So if you want to check out how you can leverage Find Away Voices as an author, you can check them out over at starkreflections.ca slash findaway. And now comments from recent episodes. There was a comment from episode 154. This was September 2020 on the episode Memories of and Reflections on T.S. Paul. The comment came from Philip Smith. Philip wrote, I'm just learning of this now. I used to love hearing T.S. Paul on podcasts and reading him in groups because he was a rebel and a fellow short story writer. I recently checked his stuff out on Facebook to see what the heck he's been up to. When I didn't see anything recent, I wondered if he gave up writing or maybe had a falling out with his publishing partners. I never suspected he was dead. Very sad. He and his family are in my prayers, but glad the man left behind at least some legacy with his fiction. Rest in peace. Thanks so much for sharing that, Philip. <laughs> I was just getting emotional thinking uh, about how long it's been, you know, more than a year since uh, since we lost him. And yeah, it, it's amazing. You know, you, you you know of people in the industry and you've interacted with them and you had a chance or heard them on podcasts or whatever. And then you find out that they have passed away. But yes, yes, he left a legacy. He left a legacy for the readers who have loved his fiction. And he left a legacy for all of those authors that... You know, I was fortunate enough to get to hang out with him on several occasions and interview him uh, on multiple occasions as well for video and podcasts, etc. Uh, but all, all the all the people that he inspired and helped and informed. So he does live on through our memories of all that he's done for us as authors, all that he has done for readers as well. And thank you, Philip, so much for leaving that comment. Yeah, I can't believe how uh, emotional I got there for a second when I was reading it. I almost had to stop and stop recording and try again, but no, going to keep going. But if you want to leave comments for episodes of the podcast, you can leave them over on any episode of StarkReflections.ca. And now, a welcome to new patrons to the podcast. This week, I would like to welcome new patron Joanne Carson. Joanne, welcome to the patron team, the Patreon team, the patrons of the Stark Reflections podcast. You should have access to the additional content that's available over at patreon.com slash starkreflections. And thank you, Joanne, so much for your support. Your support and the support of the many awesome patrons of this podcast just help pay for my time in producing the show. And as I threatened, or as I promised, uh, I'm going to be hosting uh, an open uh, our Q&A for the podcast is going to be uh, open to all the patrons to just come hang out, ask questions. I'm going to be posting that. It'll happen sometime in December so I can get an extra episode of the podcast out that is a recording of these conversations because I am positive that my awesome patrons are going to have some dynamic things to say and questions to ask and things that we can cover that can benefit the entire audience. 
of the Stark Reflections podcast. So thank you again, Joanne, for joining. And thanks to all my patrons who support this podcast over at patreon.com slash Stark Reflections. Okay, in terms of a personal update, I'm going to keep this short, as I often say, but rarely do. But this time it is going to be short. So I am still in the throes uh, of, of, of tweaks and little pieces for uh, Fright Night's Big City. I am working on so many other collaborative writing projects that I'm not going to talk about right now. There's nonfiction and fiction. And and last time I talked about that um, the Canadian Mounted book, which is the planes, trains, and automobiles thing. But that's kind of... That's it. Uh, I've already shared my personal update about how flippin' excited I was to get. And I was flipping. I was dancing around the house and, and, and Liz was looking at me like, what, 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 what's going on? And I was like, I got a chirp deal. I got a chirp deal. Um, uh, and then I was going to do the Eddie Murphy. I got an ice cream thing. And, and then she's like, you're done. You are done. <laughs> but, uh, but I'm so, so thrilled about that. So that's going to be it for my personal update because nobody really wants to hear me sing, do they? No, no, they don't. Why don't we get to the interview with Paulette Stone? Paulette, welcome to the Stark Reflections podcast. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me, Mark. <laughs> oh, I am so thrilled to get a chance to speak with you again. Of course, my listeners have not had the chance to hear you, which is why I was so thrilled that you agreed to come on the podcast. So, Love Only Better. Let's talk about your new book. What is Love Only Better? Love Only Better is a women's fiction novel, um, loosely, or not so loosely, <laughs> based on my personal experiences, kind of having some struggles in the bedroom. And the main character takes this journey um, to try to find herself, to embrace her pleasure life as a woman. It's something that you know we don't ever talk about. And it just felt like it was time for us to have that kind of a conversation for women. So, okay. So you said it was based on reality. It was based on something real. What made you decide to write this as a novel as opposed to, let's say, a memoir? Well, when I was kind of going through this, I was raised by a single dad and, you know, we never had the talk. Like, we never had, <laughs> you know, the birds and bees uh, conversation. So when I entered adulthood, I kind of didn't know what I was doing. So when I was going through that and I was looking for information, it really spanned, it, it kind of was either dry and clinical or like super kinky, you know, in like the porn realm or something, but there wasn't anything in between, something that was approachable so people could get good information and maybe in a more um, absorbable fashion. So when I was approaching the book, I, I thought about a memoir, but I really felt that most people that needed the information probably you know, may not be in that memoir um, genre readers on a typical basis. So I felt like a fiction book would make it a little bit more widely available for people who might need the information. Okay. Was there ever any... Um... Anything you wanting to hold you back because a little bit um, unconventional, a little bit, a little bit taboo. <laughs> we don't, like you said, we don't, we don't talk about this. Yeah, we don't talk about women, how women experience pleasure, how that works, and how it's different than men. We don't ever talk about that. So, a hundred percent, I was very. Um, concerned about how I should approach the book and how it would be received and you know that's probably why it took 15 years you know it's you go to the you know PTA meetings or the soccer field or your office and you know what are you doing Paulette you're writing that book about you know women in the bedroom and I was like, <laughs> it's, it's like how do you have that conversation so yeah so it took me a little a little bit to get there and um it made it take probably a little bit longer than it, and it should have so you said, uh, you said 15 years. Can you, can we, can we walk through a little bit of that? It sounds like I was going to say it's like a, a tantric experience, yes. <laughs> so, <laughs> but can you talk through that experience of, of the, the idea of formatting it, the writing process, et cetera? Yeah. Well, I started a little bit after I finished going through this, this whole journey of where I started going to doctors, to try, you know, figure it out. I was in a clinical study that was um, researching women who were having, you know, trouble experiencing pleasure in the bedroom. And, you know, that went on to a coach, a bedroom coach. I don't know if we can say the M word, but it was a, uh, right. you know, an M coach <laughs> for women. Yeah. And I went through that and it was just too nuts. It was too nuts. Like I jumped through so many hoops and it felt in many respects 
like, oh, what a waste. What a waste that I had to go through all of that to figure this out. And I just felt like most people would not jump through the hoops that I did. And most people do not have access to that kind of um, resources that I had living in a big city in, you know, in right. New York City. Most people don't have those things right at their fingertips. And it just felt like, like I have to pay this forward. Like I have to help the rest of the women that are still out there struggling. You know, I got mine, but they, they don't have theirs. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I love that. So, so a part of the motivation then was obviously you can't be the only one. There's got to be other women experiencing this and yeah. they don't know who to talk to. They have nobody to talk to. It, so there's got to be elements of the book that are, I'm not, I was going to say clinical, but that they are potentially helping them, first of all, see that it's not as isolated as we may think or that they're not alone. Uh, what, what, other, what other things have you heard from, from readers about, uh, about the, the reaction? Yeah, the reaction has been really fascinating. It's everyone's like, oh my God, like this could be my story. You know, I've had okay. really powerful um, messages from women that this could be my story. I'm so glad we're talking about this. Um, other women were a little bit, wow, you know, just the topic. And they didn't experience it themselves, but they it put them in a better place to speak with their friends or their family. Um, right. Other, you know, I had heard from one person, I won't tell you who, but she was like, oh my God, there's such great information in this book. I'm already using it with my boyfriend. You know? <laughs> so, Perfect. <That's> awesome. yeah. <laughs> yes. And then, you know, I had you know, another reader and she's like, you, know, you took a really difficult topic and made it a beach read. So it's kind of, you know, so it's, I feel like people are getting it. It's definitely not for everyone. There's a lot of really intimate um, scenes in the book that, you know, might make some people uncomfortable, but you know, that's okay. You know, not every book is for everyone. But for those people who need this, it can be really life giving. Cool, cool. So how so how important then is um, is humor to dealing with such a sensitive <laughs> topic? Yes, I I have some people say that it's laugh out loud funny. There are definitely some really amusing moments in the book. As mm -hmm. you know, she's kind of fumbling through, like she's just trying to figure this out, and she's. She got this a little bit of a cat and mouse game with um, with her love interest in the book when that part kicks in. Um, so it, it starts off a little bit, you know, on a individual journey character arc kind of for the first third of the book. And then she starts applying the lessons she's learning with um, with her romantic partner and her hunky boyfriend who lives across the hall or soon to be boyfriend at some point. But um, the guy across the hall type of thing. So, um, so there's definitely amusing moments that kind of break the tension and I think make it fun and she has you know her gal pals and you know they're snarky and sarcastic and I guess I've heard very New Yorkish so <laughs> they've got a, a little bit of bite to them that some readers are like wow you know but I guess this is, we're just a little bit of a tougher edged I guess <laughs> in right. New York. <laughs> so so I've got to ask uh, so the did you ever imagine that you would be writing a book and how did, I, I want to talk about, you know, obviously the process of getting to the writing the book. And then once you wrote it, the process of how you decided to publish. Yeah, I, um, it was funny. I've worked in marketing for, you know, a few decades now. And, you know, I had a, a boss early on tell me he thought I was a good writer. And I was like, really? You know, and it was the first time someone had said he thought I was a good writer. So that kind of stuck with me. And as I went through my professional career and, and started integrating writing a little more into my, into my daily role, and now I'm a full-time marketing writer now, I've always dreamed of writing a book you know it just okay. felt like you know anyone who's an avid reader and you go to the bookstores the libraries and you see all those lovely tomes on the shelves and you just want one you want your name on one of those so it was it's been a dream it's been a dream for a long time and when I started writing the book I queried at you know the most god-awful inappropriate moments of the book like it wasn't ready you know? <laughs> it, just, it wasn't there. it wasn't there and um so when and then I did you know do the agent route for a while and it, you know just didn't get the traction and now that I know more about um, indie publishing and the publishing in general I understand why you know it wasn't um, the first book people maybe would have been jumping at just because it's a taboo topic I think that there are a lot of publishers that just didn't want to <laughs> touch this with a ten foot ball and and that's okay because it led 
me to my indie journey. And I'm just such on the indie soapbox, you know, waving the flag and trying to get everyone to follow me, you know, because <laughs> right, I'm like, right. I, 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 my soul dies a little bit when I get on Twitter and I hear people like, oh my God, rejection, I want to jump off a cliff. And I'm like, indie publish, you know, <laughs> like, you know, they're a great podcast. There's Mark, Leslie the Babe, and there's Joanna Penn, and there's Sasha Black, and Orna Ross. And, you know, there's a whole indie intelligentsia out there waiting to help everybody get to their, um, make their vision a reality. So it's, it's I'm really excited about it. But, well, that well, thank this you. is how I'm, I ended I'm, up. I'm honored to be included amongst such royalty <laughs> of, of the indie publishing scene. Thank yes. you. Um, <laughs> So let, let's talk about that. How did you how did you do your research? How did you you know learn about how to do this in the uh, process? So you obviously talked about the Creative Pen podcast. I'm assuming yes. that's been an integral part. Orna it, from the Alliance, Orna and Sasha from the Alliance of Independent yes. Authors. Uh, how, how did you how did you put, piece this all together? Well, I was just looking for resources um, on on writing and how do you go about this whole self publishing thing. I was a little bit unsure of it at the beginning because you know there is that stigma out there that the quality isn't right, and I just wanted to do it right. If I was going to indie publish, I wanted to make sure that my book would be indistinguishable from any book that you'd pick up on a shelf and read. And so I, I started digging into that and I came across uh, Joanna Penn's website and that led me to her podcast. And, you know, I've just been, you know, scribbling up the alt of Joanna Penn <laughs> for, like, <laughs> for, for like months, you know, for over a year, you know, about a year and a half now, you know, I feel like I've got my, my indie education and then one led me to the next one. And then you learn into the marketing podcast, you know, six figure authors and, you know, the sell more book show and, you know, just everything, you know, from book descriptions to, you know, self-publishing podcast, you know, just kind of, they start fueling you and they lead to different things. I early on bought one thing I did invest in pretty early on was Nick Stevenson's course, right. your first 10,000 readers. And okay. that really was really helpful. So I, I referred back to that a lot and just teaching you that the different steps along the way um, and integrating craft with business at the same time was a huge part of it. And just really taking it seriously as a business. So I've tried to think of anything that I spend or any book I buy is an investment in the craft and the business. So, um, yeah, it's been, it's been a fun and exciting journey and, and I, I've really enjoyed it a lot. I like the control that I get out of the whole process and driving my destiny. Awesome. I love that too. So, um, you, you had a background, um, in, in marketing. Yes. Uh, how, did, <laughs> how were you able to apply any of that, uh, towards, you know, book stuff that was yes. any of it transferable? hundred <laughs> percent. I've been, I've been, I've been selling other people's products for like 30 years. So now right. I get to sell my own projects. So I just really tried to apply the same practices. I, you know, got a website early, you know, um, Nick Stevenson's really big on using reader magnets to build newsletter lists. So I started that, you know, probably about six, eight months. I started a monthly newsletter before I actually um, published the book. So I had, I was hoping to have a base. I, had an, an advanced reader team from that I, you know, called together from people I knew and also people that, you know, volunteered through the newsletter. I have, you know, automation so, sequence. So how did you, what did you, put, <laughs> what did you put out there to, to, to bring in these new people? I wrote a prequel because okay. my story has one POV for the main character, but there's, you know, the dreamy the guy next door that has no POV and people have been really interested. And like, I want to hear from Kyle. Like, I want to hear what's going on in that beautiful mind of his. So I wrote a prequel that follows Kyle um, before he meets Rebecca, the main character, and it ends when they meet. So oh, it's okay. a so nice... It's, yay. Okay. Yay. <laughs> It's, oh, the it's, it's the pre-meet cute. It's the pre-meet. It's the pre-meet cute. And actually, the same scene, their meet scene, is in the prequel at the very end. And then you you get it from Rebecca's POV right. in the main book, but you get it from Kyle's POV in the prequel. So um, that's what I use. And I, you know, I ran ads on Facebook um, to it, and I started at twelve people on my newsletter list for people that I knew, my friends and family, and I just passed eight hundred. Wow. Um, this year so I feel like that's a pretty <laughs> a pretty, I'm pretty happy with that all right cool so let's talk about you recently uh, launched it um let's talk about the launch process how you leveraged your your advanced reader team etc 
Yeah. So I published wide. So I did have it up for pre-sale. I was trying to get some reviews up early on the sites that allow that, but obviously Amazon, it needs to be live <laughs> for yeah. the reviews. So I did push the book up early about a week before um, to try to get the reviews up before launch. So when people, when I started, you know, running some advertising that there would be some, you know, social proof already there on the page. So right. did that a little early. Um, and i applied for and got a book bug featured new release like <laughs> wow okay first book <laughs> first book first time asking I just like oh then I heard this isn't usually how it goes <laughs> <laughs> normally it takes forever to get one of these how yeah, many I just asked, did you get uh, uh, this is my first query <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Wow. No, it was like, oh, is this supposed to happen? Well, but that must have been a sign. So, so there, I, I'm, I'm going to take this from BookBub's point of view. They saw, they saw the book come in. They looked at the cover. They read the description. They went and looked at it. Probably pre-order on Amazon or whatever sites. They must have seen something that said, yes, this is worth it, because they, they have to reject so much good, uh, so many good books, uh, but they have to reject so often. Obviously, you had done something right. I like to think so. I think that the effort we put in to, you know, getting a great cover quality to honing the, the book description and, you know, I did some A-B tests. I forget there's some A-B test platform. So I did a little bit of A-B test of a book description. Okay. Um, I forget the platform name, but it was like, you know, 25 bucks or something to do like an A-B test of book descriptions. And um, it was up on NetGalley and it did explode over the summer on NetGalley because we had uh, hundreds of downloads. So there were How fights already. Downloads? There were over 300 wow. requests on NetGalley. And I did hire a, a PR firm and they said that was the most request they had ever yeah, that's gotten. that's a lot. That is a <laughs> yes. lot. I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm just from the numbers I've seen, I was like 300 on NetGalley. Yeah, wow. it's over 300. It's probably closer to 350. So there was a little bit of a battle going on on Goodreads, like oh, like in the summer, because people, you know, I did make the mistake at the beginning, and we can talk about this if you want, about positioning as a romance. And the romance readers got in there and they um, did, they were like, this is women's fiction. Some of the medical stuff we just right. talked about was a little, you know, off genre for them. So then they were having battles and conversations, but maybe just the fact that there were a lot of reviews, a lot on the TBR list and right. conversations going back and forth, you know, maybe BookBub did look at that too. So right. even though it was maybe not all positive, but it was activity. So let's talk about that positioning, because I know that you are in the process of making some changes. Can you talk about what led to the decisions that you made there and then what led to realizing or understanding, I need to tweak this? Yeah, so I, you know, I thought I had done my research really well as a marketer. I went in, I looked at my competitive set, I looked at resources online that, you know, contemporary romance, you have, you know, curly font, you have solid color, you have illustrated characters, you have, you know, two, you know, they're all like I tried to hit every single requirement for the cover. And we had this, um, had, I had custom graph illustrations made for the cover. And, um, it came out super cute. And I think that's probably why it kind of blew up. On the it's a gorgeous cover, cover, actually, yeah. Super, yeah. Actually, where is it? I, have I was hiding it a little bit because I know this is going to go out. Probably my new cover will be available by then. But um, <laughs> this is the current cover. The current cover. And then, okay, yeah. And then, and so, so like, super cute. So it's, there's nothing, I mean, I was going to say, there's nothing wrong with that cover. It's a gorgeous cover. It pops. Yes. It, it looks, oh, compelling. But even though it was a gorgeous cover, you found out that it was maybe attracting and like attracting this group and it needed to be over here a little bit? Yes, it was definitely attracting the contemporary romance crowd and it didn't fit in that trope. Um, I, you know, I've since learned, you know, I newbie indeed, didn't know, I didn't know, you know, it has a single POV for the main character. The, the meet cute happens too late in the book and just some of the more serious um, growth arc themes are um, independent of the romance. Like the romance isn't driving the story as much as it should be in a traditional romance story. So right. it's the growth character arc with the huge you know, chunk of the romance in, in the book, but it's 
you know, I guess technically she could have that entire arc without him. <laughs> she could, you know. <laughs> yeah. So, so it's women's fiction, and she was just a conduit. <laughs> yes, she was a conduit. She was using it for his cuteness. Um, <laughs> um, okay, so let's talk. Let's talk about that then. So it's it is humorous, obviously, right? It's got yeah. some very uh, uh, not graphic, but very intimate. <laughs> moments to the book but it also has a lot of humor and that's women's fiction so humorous women's fiction are, are we getting like the right area right yeah there? you know I did I like I think that where I'm going to be hanging out as an author is in this this spot in women's fiction that's a little more sensual um I feel like there's a lot of women's fiction out there that they fade to black you know in those intimate scenes or they don't have them and I just feel like as women and maybe this is part of the whole crux of my book is that, you know, we don't necessarily embrace our sensual selves as much as we should as women. You know, if you, I'm just going to get a little off topic, hope that's okay. You know, if you yeah. look at the data, the data is showing that women are, you know, only finish in the bedroom 33% of the time while men do 75% of the time. So there's a huge- Actually, it's that low for men, 75%? It, it, okay. It is. Wow. And it's funny because in the LGBT and that's for heterosexual couples for in the LGBTQ plus community, it's still lower and lesbians are still lower than gay men. So no matter how any way you slice the data, women are not as satisfied. Regardless, as men in yeah, the, the women are always getting the short end of the stick. <laughs> They're getting the short end of the stick, exactly. Wow. So, um, so God, what was the question? No, I lost track of this. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. I mean, this is, this is an interesting topic because I think it's an important topic because like you said, it's unconventional. It's, it's taboo. We don't, we don't talk about this. And you're approaching yes, the question. Yes. yes. So what I'd like, so I feel like there's probably a lot of women who feel really disconnected from their sensual side of themselves. And maybe that's potentially, I have this little theory of why women's fiction developed to be so absent to be so absent on the intimate space so what I'd like to do as an author and as an indie I can do it because no one's here to tell me I can't right. is to maybe up the level of sensuality on the women's fiction maybe so it you can think of it as maybe a little more prose forward romance or intimate women's fiction but kind of in that space I feel like that's where I want to be hanging out so hopefully I can find an audience of people looking for those types of stories well, it sounds like from the feedback uh, that you've gotten already that it's hitting on a lot of notes with with a lot of different readers saying, oh, my God, this could be me or. Uh, yeah. So what uh, what else have you found uh, or, or what are you hoping for from uh, the reading community with this book? I'm hoping that people will use it as a tool to start a really important conversation for women because as we you know think of ourselves as women coming into our own having an equal place in our society whether that's you know in the boardroom or in you know in the white house or wherever you have you the bedroom is a place where we don't talk about we don't talk about having equality in the bedroom we don't talk about women embracing their sensual selves and asking for more and making education around pleasure a little bit more of a conversation for women so that they know that they're actually missing something. You know, I've had letters from people who were like, you know, into their twenties, they didn't know what the big deal about sex was because it was like, man, you know, <laughs> and then when they figured it out, they're like, Oh, this is what it's, I was missing out. So I love women to just even know that they're missing out and then try to start that journey to figure out what's right for them. Yeah, it's like it's it's almost like you've you've tried. Well, well, I've had this kind of food before. No, 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 you haven't had this kind of food before, made yes. by the right chef. <laughs> yes, yes. Okay. Okay. It's like when my kids' friends used to come over, they'd be like, "Oh yeah, I don't like pork chops. I don't like whatever." I'm like, "Oh, you've never had good pork chops." <laughs> Bingo. You've there had, you go. You've had good fried chicken. That's you don't like it because you haven't had the right kind. <laughs> wow. So, uh, so the you you had a book bub. Uh, you had the launch. You had the advanced readers. You had a lot of early reviews. Yeah. The results been relatively okay with the release of this so far. Uh, you told me they were. <laughs> like I didn't know what I was doing, so I didn't know what good meant, what bad went. You know, so um, it's been about a month now, just a month. Right. Um, in the next day or so, and I've sold like a, a, about four hundred and thirty ish copies. Um, so you tell me that's decent. So I. Can <laughs> <laughs> it's it's I don't know uh, ebook better. and print, right? It's ebook and print. Yeah, I looked into the, you know, I, I wanted to make sure there was an audience before even 
delving into the whole audio thing. I, I'm not, I think I'm just too young in my indie life to bother with audio right now. <laughs> but um, yeah, so I pulled back a little on the advertising because of the cover swap that's coming up. But once yeah, yeah. the cover change happens, then I'll, you know, I'll be, you know, trying to refine my skills in the selling the book um conversation as I work on book two yeah well that way the 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 cover's gonna line up more with the ideal reader it's gonna be like yes dead on as opposed to slight overlap I guess yeah totally and and then I'm also working on I think a free holiday book for my Mm -hmm. newsletter list so So you're still you're still keeping the newsletter satisfied then yes I um I send it every month and I did a really interesting thing I segmented my list into the people who open and the people who don't because I felt like my open rates were probably better than they seem to be and they just doubled (laughs) like (laughs) once once I took those non-openers out you know the open rate went up you know at least you know 10 15 percentage points so I I can get a better read on who's opening it what they're clicking on what they like Um, I'm been doing a lot of um book funnel promotions since those are free and um so i like to put free you know free promo promos in there so there's a little bit of a you know reason to open it and see what's going on awesome so you're working on more content for your newsletter subscribers to give them stuff are you working on another another book you said this is going to be a genre you're going to continue to this is going to be your genre you're going to just go yes forward yes i'm going to make a new genre (laughs) Other books in the works and then? Uh... Yes. Yes, I have book two. I finished the first draft and I'm editing now. I'm going to do my first NaNoWriMo. How do you say it? NaNoWriMo, yeah. Oh NaNoWriMo. Exciting. I'm going to try to just see if I can knock out my second edit in November and try to get that to Alpha Readers, hopefully in December and um, see if I can get that out by May. Um, and then, you know, writing the short story, give away from a newsletter list. I have, I think, at least two more books in the series in my head and I have a little spreadsheet going of some standalone series. books that are so, unrelated. So, so do we get to see her again then? Is that the... Yes, it's, it's, and this is not a romance trope, so I'm not romance anymore. It's the same two characters okay. from the first book, but they have, each has a POV and there's like a kind of a weird triangle thing love triangle thing going on and it's still on the same topic of women's pleasure a little bit but I also shift the commentary a little bit to Kyle's experiences um so so that'll be a little interesting I feel like in between women's fiction with some sexy stuff going on with a little hint of social commentary so I feel like that's kind of where I'm gonna be that's the pond I'm gonna be in I think awesome and so what, what advice would you, having done all this research, having done this work, having gone through the process very successfully, taken Nick's course and all of the learnings you've done, what's some advice that you would uh, offer to an author who's considering writing, publishing a book? I would do it. Just uh-huh. do it. You know, just sit down, make it a priority in your life. Like I was, you know, I, like I said, I took 15 years to write the first book. I wrote the first draft of the second book in four months this summer because I just got up every morning at a certain time and I made that a priority and I just kind of knocked it out. Um, but I would also think of it as an investment because there's um, of time and effort. There are there are cheaper ways to do things. There's more expensive shortcuts, but, you know, whatever works for you. But think of this as an author business. And I know that's talked about a lot in indie circles, you know, thinking of it as an author business, authorpreneur, that you have to think of it that way because there are so many facets that you need to juggle yourself. Um, You know, I have a spreadsheet. I had a launch spreadsheet, so I knew everything I had to do from getting the copyright, everything. It's gonna gonna take time and be patient with yourself. Everything time you do something will be for the first time, but once you learn it, you learn it. So now I have my template for my copyright page and I know where to apply with the US Copyright Office to get my copyright. Like I know all these things and I have my bookmarks and it's gonna be so much easier the second time through. Awesome, awesome. And so for any authors out there who have an unconventional, well, an unconventional taboo topic, that they want to write about, that they've wanted to write about. Do you have any advice specifically for them? Yeah, I I think you need to steal yourself that not everyone is gonna appreciate what you bring forth and not everyone is gonna want to have that conversation, but that's okay. Like, so you just need 
to be okay with the negativity that's going to come your way because it's not for everyone. But when you hear from those people that it is for, that do appreciate your message, who get it, those people will make the effort worth it. You just need to be ready and understand that your topic is taboo for a reason. It's because people don't want to talk about it. And, you know, when you step forward, um, there is a level of bravery you need to have to do that, but it's not insurmountable and you should go ahead and give it a try. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you, Paulette, so much for this fascinating conversation. Can you please let my listeners know where they can find uh, out about you online, where they can find this, uh, this amazing new book of yours? Yeah, Love Only Better is on sale wide, so you can buy it in any country, in any platform. It's on Amazon and Barnes & Noble and Kobo and Google Play and Apple Books, and you can request it at your library. You can um, get it at a local bookstore, request it that they carry it, absolutely. Um, You can visit my website, um, paulettestout.com. Um, on social media at Paulette Stout Author um, on Facebook and Instagram and on Twitter on that Stout content. So awesome. um, I'm on all of those way too much. <laughs> I'd love, <laughs> yeah, love to all. hear from you if you're interested. Uh, help awesome. you have a conversation. Uh, there will be links, of course, in the show notes for that at starkreflections.ca. Paulette, thank you again so much for a great conversation. Thank you, Mark. There are two things I wanted to reflect on with Paulette. Now, the first is is related to the cover, and this is really important uh, to discuss, is that her first cover was gorgeous. It was awesome. I looked at it and was like, yeah, that looks like a great book. I want to read it. I want to check it out. But there's a difference between a good cover or a great cover, or whatever that is, just beautiful cover that that is awesome, and a cover that tells the audience of a particular expectation. And so what she ran into with some of her early reviews were people who picked it up expecting the tropes of uh, rom-com and and that is not what she gave them. She gave them more women's fiction. She had uh, several crossover elements and there probably are readers who enjoy a good rom-com, they enjoy women's fiction, they enjoy romance, etc., But there were enough people that expected it to be a comedic romance as opposed to uh, a women's fiction novel that had comedic elements but was of a very serious issue. And obviously the content was a lot more, uh, the intimacy was portrayed uh, more, um, not in the dark, not behind the scenes, but right out there in front and pointing very specifically on a taboo issue, something you do not talk about. And so she went with a new cover. Uh, and if you go to starkreflections.ca for episode 223, you'll see her first cover and her second cover. They're both great covers, but they both speak to the audience differently. And that's an important thing to do. Now, th- this is this is the thing I, I, I love about someone like Paulette, who is business-oriented and savvy enough to understand that even though she invested a lot in, in the first cover, She was going to have to reinvest and get a revised cover. And that's going to help her in the long run because more of the people who pick it up are going to know more of what to expect. So a combination of seeing that new cover, the reviews, etc. are going to then help, obviously. And the blurb as well. You should check out the blurb uh, as well. Just see, look at the blurb, look at the new cover, and you'll see what I mean. That's the first thing I wanted to reflect on. The second thing I wanted to reflect on was... When when Paulette and I were first chatting, she thought, "Well, I haven't. I, I, uh, it, it tanked. I haven't sold many." And this is something that really frustrates me about the indie author community: is, oh my God, there's hundreds of thousands of us, um, maybe tens of thousands of active players uh, who you know regularly publish. You know, just do more than one book, for example. And there's a lot of podcasts out there. I listen to a lot of them. Uh, Many of the ones that Paulette mentions, of course, I listen to as well. And one of the frustrating things is we typically only have the people who are making really, really good money reveal their numbers. And that's probably because it's kind of like it's embarrassing. Well, I sold a book this month and I'm so happy. Maybe it's, it's more embarrassing to share your numbers when 
when things aren't as, as good. But when Paulette shared her numbers, I looked at her numbers and I compared it to the average sales of the average author in her genre and thinking, you know what, you moved over 400 copies in the first month. That's, you know, it's not going to be New York Times, uh, USA Today bestseller status or any of those things that we're used to seeing because that tend to be the only people we hear from. But it's damn better than most books that sell. And not enough authors hear that. Not enough authors hear that. So Paulette will look at that and go, oh my God, I bombed. I didn't do well at all because everyone else must have sold 4,000 copies in a day. The, the reality is, is most authors aren't doing that. Yes, I know it's possible. And yes, I know there are authors who do it. And I know them. I know many of them. <laughs> I probably know 50 or more or 100 uh, probably authors who, yeah, oh my God, if I sell less than 4,000, that's, that's a bad day for me. But the reality, and I'm not sure where you are, dear listener, in your writing journey, but the reality is to have those kinds of numbers that Paulette has is actually quite good. Um, I know there's always more and we always want more and and there's always chances to grow. But I do know, based on some of the stats from Canadian book selling, that in in Canada, and this goes back about more than 10 years when I was uh, doing a lot more in the book industry, that the average book in Canada sells less than 100 copies. The average book published in Canada sells less than 100 copies. Paulette, in her first month, already sold. No, it wasn't all print copies, and, and this is a print book stat from way back when. But no, she sold over 400 copies in the first month. She's already outsold the average book in Canada. (laughs) So she's ahead of the game. And I know Canada is a smaller population, uh, for example. So it it, it is a smaller demographic than, you know, the U.S., uh, for example. But keep that in mind. When you're thinking about how you're doing, are you only trying to compare yourself to those blockbusters? It's kind of like you comparing yourself to, if you're a romance writer and go, well, I'm not selling as many as Danielle Steele or Nora Roberts, you know, or me as a horror writer. Well, you know, I did well, but I'm not selling as much as Stephen King. What's the point of trying to compare yourself to, to the mega blockbusters as opposed to comparing yourself to, well, you know, uh, I released this book and when I released the other book last year, this is how much I sold, but I've already sold more in a shorter time period. And I, there go the dogs rushing to the door because they think Liz is coming home. I'm just leaving it in. That's all there is to it. (laughs) But what was I babbling about? I really should pay attention when I'm talking. Um, Hope you are. (laughs) I I think the challenge is we, we look at those numbers and we're down on ourselves because we're comparing ourselves not to ourselves, not to how much we've grown. And how much better uh, we've done as opposed to comparing ourselves to someone else's, you know, 10th book or 15th book or or 50th book, right? If I start thinking, I'm very proud of this podcast. I'm very proud of my listeners and I'm so thrilled. As I mentioned a few episodes back, I was so thrilled to to, to actually have, I think I had half a dozen people that uh, met me at um, 20 Books Vegas said that they listen to this podcast and they really love it. I was not expecting that many people to to even be aware of it. That makes me warm. If I think to you know my good friend Joanna Penn, who has been podcasting, she's about episode seven hundred or whatever, and has been doing this for a long, long time. And 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 her podcast is the you know the royalty of of indie author podcasts. It it is it is just high quality, amazing content, well deserved, amazing hard work for over a decade. But if I compared my weekly downloads to Joanna's. I'd probably just crawl under a rock and cry and then maybe eat a tub of ice cream and go listen to Phil Collins and Alicia Witt songs and cry and feel bad about myself. And that's nowhere, that's not any place to be. I know this is a bit of a longer rambling uh, reflection, but I want to remind you, if you're down on yourself as we're getting towards the end of 2021, if you're down on yourself because that book you released didn't do as well as you had hoped or you're looking at other people's numbers and you're like, oh, I'm not there yet. Don't despair. Compare how you're doing to how you did before. Compare the brilliance and skill that you have as a writer to where it was when you started. Always be moving forward. Always be looking at how much better you're getting. 
what you're learning. Okay, you had a bomb. The your last book did great, and this new book didn't do great. It bombed. It it you know maybe 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 you sold a hundred copies of the first book, and this other book you just sold twenty. Okay, and you're like, oh my god, that's like. I can't do the math. You know, that's uh, 20%. Yeah, that's what it is. 100 to 20. Mark, God, I don't need to take my shoes and socks off to do math. <laughs> but, uh, you know, 20% of what I did the last time. Okay. What did you learn from that? What did you do differently? What were all the different factors? You can learn from that. You can kind of take that and you can move forward. What I really don't want is I really don't want you to be down on yourself. I really don't want you to beat yourself up. I really want you to think about the long term and I want you to think about if things didn't work out the way you were hoping, what were the things you learned from them? How are you going to move forward? And also, are you comparing yourself to the you from the past? And are you growing and changing and learning as an author? And that's all we can do is continue to grow and change and learn and get better. And hopefully the things that we write are connecting with readers because that's Yes, obviously we want to sell lots of copies. Yes, uh, probably have a goal of making some money off this, maybe full-time, maybe part-time, whatever your goals happen to be. But at the end of the day, often, when you're writing a book, it really is to connect with other humans because that's what this is all about. Well, that's it for this episode of the Stark Reflections podcast. Thank you so much for listening to the podcast. If you would like to support the podcast, there is, of course, patreon.com slash starkreflections, but you do not have to become a patron, though I do say thanks and hello and love you, all my patrons, but I do love you, the listener. You listening helps this podcast. You telling a friend about this podcast that you think would get value in it helps this podcast, and you, of course, leaving a review on the podcast of your choice does make a huge difference for this podcast. So thanks again for listening. Until next week and next episode, this is Mark Leslie LeFevre wishing you great writing, stop barking dogs, and good, good stark reflections. Thank you for listening to the Stark Reflections podcast. You can find show notes for each episode at starkreflections.ca. The music for this podcast, Laser Groove, was composed and produced by Kevin McLeod. Check out more of Kevin's great music at incomptech.com. So I did this thing last episode, episode 222, where uh, after the audio, after the closing credits, I had a short clip. It was a clip from Planes, Trains, and Automobiles based on what I talked about earlier. Thought that was funny. How many of you heard that? How many of you are listening now? That was um, um, Liz did come home. The dogs went ape shit as they do. Uh, and, and I left that in and I left and you can actually hear her telling them to calm down. Just curious. How many of you are actually listening to this? How many of you listen all the way to the bitter, bitter end? Leave a comment. Let me know. Maybe it's just our secret, just you and I. Just, I'm talking and you're listening, but maybe most people, maybe they're not listening to that. Yeah. Okay, talk to you later.